Hi, I'm Michael Hansen and welcome to this video. In this video I'm going to try to sort of present you to the astronomical equipment that I have. I'm going to give you give you sort of a real basic overview on how it works and what I can do with it. And then finally I will show you an, a recording I have from a previous observation I actually did where I'll show you where you can see how it is done from the point of view of the computer. Now, as you probably can see, we are in a very different place than I usually make my videos. We are, in fact, at my parents or in my parents' garage. Now, the explanation for this is actually quite simple. Um, my wife and my kids, we live uh, and me, we live in a relatively small small apartment in Copenhagen. And besides from the fact that we don't actually have the place to store all this equipment, it, it's pretty big, some of it, um, and heavy. The viewing opportunities in Copenhagen, Copenhagen is not that good because of the sky glow from, uh, from, from the city, from the city lights and so on. Even out here where my parents live, in sort of a central uh, sea land, a little to the south, is actually also quite bad. They have... Uh, lamps out here on the street lamps that is glowing all night and um, yeah so but but it's definitely better and they also have the place to store my equipment the reason why i haven't set up my telescope fully because actually i do have a week's a week's vacation right now um, the reason is that at the moment it is snowing and completely uh, overcast also it's quite cold that's why i'm wearing all of this um but it's the only place i can really show you this video otherwise i would have to um, get all the equipment inside and uh, then take it outside again that would be horrible um, not good it would take too long and it would be yeah, problematic i want to say something a little disclaimer it is really messy here it's just piles of things stored on top of each other and as you can see my telescope it's, it's actually almost buried inside all kinds of other stuff but it works i think i'm going to start with uh, the telescope itself i have an ancient newtonian but i'm going to introduce to that to you later on so bye bye right uh you can't see me but i'm standing out here behind the camera and i'm doing this in order to explain to you what it is that you see most of you that are familiar with telescopes would almost immediately see what is going on here the blue thing behind here is my old telescope it is now my dad's telescope here we have a homemade solar filter for that telescope which is is broken the holes inside which will make it useless because it might ruin your eyes if you use it but this here is my primary telescope it's an eight in inch newtonian it has a focal length of two meters uh 250 no 200 centimeters uh, opening uh, mirror the primary mirror is down in the bottom i'm going to show you that in a minute um what you see here on the picture is first and foremost i'm just going to gently move the camera here you have the opening when i'm observing i remove this um, cover here here you see a search telescope when you look at it in it there's actually a crosshair inside that you can use uh, i don't use it because i i use it sometimes when um, my telescope i'm just going to um, lock the camera again so uh, I use it sometimes when my uh, alignment of the telescope is completely out of out of whack so I need to focus uh, to align it with a bright star and sometimes the easiest way to locate that star is using the finder scope as it's also called not a search scope this is my camera as you can see it's a long tube the sensor is out here in the front somewhere around here and all of this is for cooling. So as I told you in another one of my videos about how sensors works, this is a f also a color CCD. 
that means that it has a buyer matrix in front so when I take a picture I get all the colors red green and blue at the same time at the expense that I can really use filters uh, as um, efficiently as other users can uh, mainly users using a dark or black and white colors uh, black and white CCD as we call it it's not really black and white but it's okay in here I have Two filters, uh, sulfur 2, I think it is, and a uh, relatively narrow band um, hydrogen alpha filter. I also have a homemade um, black filter, as you would call it, when I make um, dark, uh, dark images for dark reduction. Um, it's a Starlight Express camera. Um, yeah, and here you see the focusing mechanism. So let's go a little further down. You can't see it. I might be able to show you. Um, um, yeah, just a second. I'm going to show you. I'm going to change the camera angle, and you're going to see a lot more of my parents' mess here. But I'm going to show you the secondary mirror, the slanted secondary mirror. Now I won't remove my camera because it's sort of pretty good align uh, with respect to where I want it so I just that is also why I leave it in like this so I mount the entire entire telescope like this um, but I'm going to remove the front cover so you can see the primary mirror and then I'm going to uh, continue down along the along the telescope so see you in a bit all right so I have removed the camera from its uh, from my tripod so or my phone actually is what I'm using here in here you can see the pipe uh, the primary mirror down there there's the primary mirror I'm just trying to get a focus on it yeah there you can see it and here is the secondary mirror so as you can hopefully sort of get an idea of it's sort of slanted upwards towards the focusing mechanism here and then uh, it's going to reflect the light upwards so and these screws that you can see is for aligning the secondary mirror so that we get all the light where we want it okay all right so now we are back at the um, bottom part of uh, the tube or my telescope and here you see the guide scope so this is a small this is a reflector because it uses mirrors and this is a refractor because it uses uh, lenses. There's a lens here and that's it. So th what this um, telescope down here does, its function is to use that little camera you can see there to keep eye on a star. So what this telescope does is that through this um, cable here that goes all the way up to the primary um, camera or imaging um, mechanism <clears throat> it will tell the software and I'm going to show you that in the in, in the other video that I'm going to show you uh, in the final part of, of sort of this presentation I'm going to show you what this telescope here actually but it keeps what it does but it keeps eye on a star and if that star moves relatively to where it started and it's going to signal the mount that I have through this cable here that you can see right here. It's going to signal the mount to move in the opposite direction. So imagine that you could sort of speak <laughs> the language of that camera. If the star moved to the left, the, the, the camera would tell the telescope or the mount move right and so forth and so on to keep the star exactly centered. The reason is that even professional telescopes, a big telescope like um, the uh, the Nordic Optical Telescope, can't keep uh, a star fixed even using professional grade equipment. So in order to keep the stars fixed, if if we don't keep the stars fixed, then we're going to get star trails. So you have seen. Obviously, you probably have seen pictures of uh, real star trails where you see sort of the the stars go in sort of a long arc on the image. 
that we want on that type of picture because the idea is to get the star trails. Um, <clears throat> but when we are doing images like I do, we don't want star trails. We want nice, crisp, round stars. So that is why we try to keep the image that we are making in the exact same position as we started throughout the entire imaging process by keeping an eye on a star. Now there are several types of um, ways you can uh, you can observe uh, a guide star. One method is to put on a secondary telescope like I have done um, to image the stars. Another method, I'm just going to turn the camera slightly. Here is that you put an off axis guider in front of the camera. So if you imagine you have the sensor here and then you have sort of a small mirror sitting like this. This is the small mirror, my the tip of my fingers, reflecting light upwards. So sometimes you can get an off axis guider that you can rotate. And then you will place the, the guide camera like this. So light comes in from uh, the telescope and parts of it get reflected upwards towards uh, the guide camera here. The advantage of that is that um, even with my exemplary motor skills <laughs> or not and keen eyes it is practically Im impossible for me to get this telescope here perfectly aligned with this telescope here um, when we are dealing with really small angles so imagine that maybe a few arc seconds maybe one arc minute could um, skew this telescope here very much away from the direction that this telescope here is looking that is the disadvantage of this time that a uh, disadvantage you don't have when an off-axis guider because it looks through the same telescope. Another advantage of the off-axis guider is <clears throat> that you are using a much bigger telescope. So you can imagine that if you have an off-axis guider on a telescope like this, you have um, an off-axis. You have you have you, you see through a uh, two hundred millimeter opening on this um, guide scope here it's not a guide scope it is a telescope I just call it a guide scope and I seem to remember that this is a five centimeter opening it's 50 millimeters you're only seeing through 50 millimeters opening so much less lights gets through here than here the advantage of this and the disadvantage of an off-axis guider is that here I get a full fu full field so I can see the entire field actually I can see much more of the field in this um, in this telescope here than I can on this so this telescope has a much smaller field this has a very large field so I can select stars all around in the field on the off axis guider I usually have a quite small field and I have very few stars to select uh, in between because I'm using that little mirror even if you can rotate the off-axis guide alone so the mirror sort of slants all the way around the opening you're still confined to that little area that the mirror provides all right but the basics of this is this telescope uses this camera over here to observe a star it's a guide telescope this is the main scope, it takes the images that I like, and this is basic, basically what I have. Also, I'm going to show you the mount in, in a little bit. And for the mount, we have these counterweights here. So you can imagine, I think this is a five kilogram counterweight. And this is used, I'm going to show you that in the next video, or the next part. So hang on, see you in a bit. So here we have my um, telescope mount. You can see this area here is where I put um, the black. You can you can get back in the uh, go a little back in the previous video. 
and then you can notice this long slider or this long bar that I have across my main telescope. This is put in here and then you tighten it with these screws here in order to keep it fixed in the same position. You might be able to see those tiny markers that I have here. I have put the same markers on the bar on my main telescope so I don't have to fiddle around finding uh, the exact best position for um, for the, the optimal point where I have um, what you call it um, <laughs> where it is um, balanced out in, in with respect to weights and just to give you an idea how big this head this is called the head is you can see my hand here and I have uh, reasonable large hands I can perhaps what can I compare it with here you have um, a normal size screwdriver so you can see how large it actually is it's pretty big and it's pretty heavy but you need that in order to uh, be able to um, hold such a large telescope that I have there in place. And the counterweights, I'm just going to... I can tell you one other thing. This is called a German equatorial mount. And the reason is that when you have normal alt ass mounts, not ass, but azimuth, they move around like this from side to side and up and down. The usual way we also look, we don't tilt our heads that much, we look up or we look down and from side to side. So that's the way. But a German equatorial mount moves like this. You can see it's a different type of type of um, of um, motion than you would expect. The reason for this is the way stars move on the sky. So if you sort of imagine that we could put a stick through this part of the mount through here, I can turn it around, I can move the camera a little bit. Now you can perhaps see the black um, plate that is here, it's sort of a little, it's, it's, it's where you look through. So. You can, you can imagine if you put a large stick through here and down through the bottom that would go all the way up to the stars or to the sky. This stick would have to point exactly at the North Star. When that is done, I'm going to move the camera away a little bit. Like this. When we have done that, then all it takes for us to observe something is that the telescope moves into the right position let's say we have a star here or an object we want to observe in order to observe it and keep observing it all the night this part here remains locked and fixed and it is just this wrecked ascension part that moves around like this. Also one other thing that you can see you saw the counterweights before and obviously the counterweights go on this. So you have this little, no you can't see it, <laughs> just a minute. We have this little um, screw down here, this little stopper, and that is to prevent, if we were not to tighten the counterweights enough to keep them in place, they wouldn't slide off. They will be stopped by this little screw here. So that's why it is there. Yeah. So that's the basics of a German equatorial mount. One final thing that I would like to show you if it is possible, I'm going to test it. It's one of the things that has always puzzled me with respect to flat earthers. And that is... Um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention. This mount here, I can uh, control it via my computer using something, something called EQMod. 
So I can control this mount perfectly with a computer on a, what do you call it, a, a observational software, something like that. All right, so one of the things, just to get back to what I said before, one of the things that have puzzled me with respect to um, flat earthers is the part about uh, the Northern Star or Polaris. And they say that in the flat earth universe, Polaris is always fixed at the same point. But the thing is, it is actually not. Polaris moves a little bit around the the what do you call it, the stellar or the the um, sky pole not the not the geographical pole but the the sky pole let's just call it that i can't remember what it's called um it actually proceeds a little bit around so i have to align the telescope relatively perfectly against the against this uh Northern Star, and I want to show you if I can how it looks through the telescope. When you look, you look down at the bottom here. You sh you take this off, and then you take this off, and you align this. I'm just going to do this right now. I think you align it. You align it like this, and then you can look through the through a little viewer that you can see in a bit, and then you use. The screw there, sorry, the screw there, screw there that you might not be able to see. It's a little metallic thing sticking out here. And then screws on the opposite side, you can see one here, to actually move it in the altitude azimuth, um, altitude azimuth direction in order to align this perfectly with the northern star. But I'm trying to, if, if, if the recording can't show it probably, pr properly, I'm um, sorry, it's really cold, so I'm, I'm having a bit difficulty talking, actually. But if the camera can show it properly, I'm going to skip that recording, but otherwise, you're going to see how it looks. So, all right, I just wanted to show you before I show the actual thing. You can see the, this is the scope that you look through. And perhaps we can see down here. Let's see. No, yeah, one thing missing. <laughs> we have to get this out so in a bit you'll just see this rod slide down so down there it is the, that little um, thingy you can see sticking out is a reticle that can be lit up so it's going to place a little red light down on the reticle I haven't turned on the the, the telescope at this moment so you won't see any light but I'm trying to go back and see if we can get a proper view through the viewfinder, the polar viewfinder and then we're going to see if that works alright yeah there you can see it I know it's a bit hard I'm going to try to align the camera again you can see it there this is the reticle that I use and when you move the that little circle is where the polar star should be and if that is aligned perfectly then the north celestial pole that what is what is what is called yeah would be where the cross is i know it's hard to see this but and if you turn the telescope around the rect ascension axis that reticule that little dot that little circle will move around like a clock so i hope now that you have sort of a basic idea, sort of an intuitional idea about how I actually perform my observations. Of course I haven't showed you how I actually um, mount the telescope uh, on the mount and how it moves around when I give it computer commands, but enough to say that in the video I'm going to finish off with here that I recorded previously, like I said in the start, you can see from the computer perspective the guide star how the guide star performs, what I'm imaging, and the exposure time, and all those things you can, I think you also can see, seem to recall that you also can see sort of a, um, an observational point of where the telescope is actually pointing at the sky. But I can't remember if I have that part with, 
I just have the search box. But I'm going to explain what goes on on the video. So hopefully you will uh, enjoy the rest of the video and then I will see you in a new video. Now, like I said, I have a uh, week's, week's vacation here, so I probably won't be as productive, yay, as I usually, usually am or not. But nevertheless, I, I'm going to be less productive. But hopefully you think this video is uh, cool. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, give it a thumbs down. But please tell me why you don't like it. And for the flat earthers that probably will be watching, no, ha 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 ha, uh, fake, um, space is fake, I don't believe you, Earth is flat, there's a firmament. These are not arguments, so please, please refrain from commenting if that is all you can say. But in any case, thank you for watching, hope to see you next time. Bye bye. Hi and welcome inside at the observatory that I have. No, actually this is inside at my parents' house. So I've made a team viewer session, so you can see there. <laughs> so I'm actually sitting inside, there's in the warm. And uh, outside I have another computer um, connected to the telescope. Um, it is so that uh, the best times to observe usually is when it's pretty cold. So yeah. But um, yes, here you see the an image of an image of an image, <laughs> an image of the galaxy that I at that moment was imaging. So this is an actual galaxy from the sky. This is not fake or CGI or anything. This is what comes from my telescope. Here you see in a graph of um, the guide star. So you can see that it is uh, bobbing up and down pretty much. And uh, here you see the guide star itself. Now the thing is with uh, this graph, if it's bobbing up and down much, it could mean several things. It could mean that there's a lot of seeing, so the guide star is, is flickering. It could also mean that the mount is moving a lot. And it could also mean that I have set the aggressiveness on the guiding too high. So it's actually, like I said, tracking the seeing instead of tracking the movement of the telescope itself. And the reason why uh, this um, image looks a little strange is because of the biometrics. So here you see um, an image from the observatory part of the controlling software. You can see uh, where the mount is pointing or actually where the software thinks the mount is pointing. And that image superimposed is an image of that galaxy. What you can do I would like to say quickly is that you can compare the stars you have on your image of the stars that you would expect there to be and then you can put it in at the right position. So in short this tells me that I am on spot roughly. Here you see the rect ascension and declination and you can actually use that address or position if you have your own telescope to see that galaxy. It's probably too faint to you for you to see it with your um, eyes, but you can definitely record it with a camera. And here you can see the camera control itself. You can see the count is going up on the seconds that I'm exposing. You can see that the seconds, you can see how many images I'm trying to make. You can also see the time, how much is elapsed. And you can see um, the maximum pixel value. You can see the full width, half medium the half flux diameter and signal to noise ratio. So this is not something that is um, uh, made on a computer or, or a CGI or something like that. That image you see there of that galaxy is something that I have recorded at that moment. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.